So I, I really like the, uh, uh, the fight to the UFC. So the, the kind of announcer there, who's always, I don't, you, you know what I mean? Uh, yeah. the, 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 and that guy who, who goes, uh, uh, Las Vegas! Yeah. <laughs> Jeff Monsanto. Awfully far back here. Okay. What are we going to talk about? How will we be Portland? No, no. People say they love Portland, but they don't really love Portland. I did a movie here. In, I mean, maybe the volcanoes by that time had subsided. It was so long ago. But but I I was doing out I think I guess on the eastern end of our and, and uh, Snake River. So I, I can't tell you how many years ago. Except it was memorable because I was coming back with my daughter from somewhere that took 14 hours to get to Portland. And I'm always embarrassed by people, oh, there's Shagger, you know, uh, or, or on an airplane, there's Shagger, I bet he's going to the bathroom. <laughs> so I try to avoid going up and down the aisles as much as possible. So I don't go up and down the aisles. So that voyage, that journey here, uh, for one, that reason was memorable. 14 hours, I never went to the toilet. My daughter still reminds me of this miraculous ability that I have. It has nothing to do with intelligence or talent, you know, physical speed. It's how long you can hold your urine. And then, the, the way, the reason I remember that journey was I was shooting up by the Snake River the eastern end, and I thought, what a beautiful spot. And there was a house for sale right on the river. So I took the money I made on that film, and I bought the house. And I assigned it to a real estate agent to rent, in, because it needed a lot of fixing up, but still livable. And so I said, all right, well, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, I'm not going to get into it right now. Uh, but if you could rent it and just make the payments, it would be fantastic. So they rented it, and about a month later, the real estate agent called and said, um, it's been vandalized, and uh, the people left, and they just screwed everything up. And after, you know, vandalizing is really about as angry an act as, as it's possible to do. You just don't want somebody to enjoy whatever it is you're vandalizing. So really weird, wicked emotion. So I said, oh my God, I don't have a paper. But read it again and try to get somebody substantial. So a month or so, and lots of repair work. And he rents it out and he calls me a month later. And then so they've left and they vandalized it again. I said, oh, I can't do that anymore. So I sold it. And I'll bet in that intervening time that house on the Snake River well, it must be worth a, a great deal of money. Um, don't, don't, don't cry for me. I think to you. What do I talk about? Put up a hand. Let me, we, got, we got the uh, right so, Yes, you and yes. No, no, stand up and, and, and there's a loud voice going to space. What? Oh, what's it like? Yes. Empty. <laughs> now, well, the question is, it was a very moving experience, and I've talked about it a great deal. In fact, um, a while ago, I was asked to entertain at the Kennedy Center, 
And uh, there's two people. Uh, Robert Sherno is a poet. He's, he does other things. And we've been friends for a long time. Over duck. What does he mean by that? There's a Chinese restaurant near, not too far from my house in Los Angeles, that specializes in Chinese duck. Robert Chernow, who lives in New York, loves Chinese duck. So for some reason, so many years ago, I started to meet him at this Chinese restaurant, not knowing that he was primarily a writer, besides the other things he did. I don't know, about five years ago, he says, I'd like to bring a friend of mine, and the friend is uh, uh, Dan Billing of the group They Might Be Giants. Does anybody know the, the group? Okay. I, I didn't know they, from might, they Might Be Giants to the uh, Beatles, you know what I mean? Uh, so apparently They Might Be Giants is really avant-garde and really creative. So Dan Miller is like the guy, and I, I know nothing. So we're having a duck, and Dan Miller says to the two of us, we should do an album, because he's a musician. And his friend, Robert Cherno, when they went to university together, lo, those many years ago, they did musicals, and Robert wrote lyrics. I said, oh, well, let's do it. So, we start writing, writing songs in the middle of COVID. And we suddenly are delirious with the joy of creating these songs. Sure enough, Robert had said, let's do them based on Bill's uh, stories, adventures. So I started telling what I thought might be good song adventures, like leaving home in a cheap old car, $400 car, and I'm leaving home. You graduated McGill University in Montreal. I've, I've worked in theater and radio and television in Montreal as an amateur. I've got my first job in summer theater where I got paid some money, and now I'm moving on to Ottawa where they had the first Canadian professional theater. They want me to, to be an actor there. So I'm leaving home, that incredible moment in uh, every, most people's lives. So I'm crossing a bridge, and it must be a bridge across the uh, St. Lawrence River, and, and an 18-wheeler is coming at me from across from there. And it's coming at me. And I'm in this little tiny English car, and that bubble of air that, the, that these 18 wheelers push, push me down, I'm not over the side. No, I'm not over the side. And I continue on. And my thought was, we're always going over a bridge, and there's always an 18 wheeler coming at us. So it became a song called The Bridge. So now, uh, and we put that out, it becomes an album called Bill, and that's in uh, Spotify and wherever else you buy albums. That was our first album together. But we had written so many songs that I get a call from the head of Kennedy Center saying, would I like to entertain at Kennedy Center, and did I have any material to sing? And Robert and Dan and I had put together 25 songs. Indeed, one of the songs, I, they had finally asked me to, to come up into space, and I'm now in New York City on my way to Texas. Okay, I'm doing something, I've forgotten what it was. And I meet with Dan and, uh, and uh, uh, Robert and Steve, and we're sitting, having dinner that Sunday night prior to my Monday morning going off to the space program. And let's write a story, let's write a song about space. So we start making some notes. One of the first things I did when I came back down was call them 
and say all those things we were thinking about, writing about space, forget about it. It has no relationship to what I did. Because what I did was go a day early. Like I, I arrived in Van Horn, Texas, in the West Texas area, the deserts. I arrived Monday morning. And I'm a day early. And I said, why am I here a day early? And uh, nobody answered. And somebody said, well, why, why don't we, after breakfast, let's go to the gantry. Well, yeah, let's, let's go to the gantry. So we drive 20 miles, all this on Jeff Bezos' land. And we get to the gantry. There's no rocket there yet. The rocket's going to go up that night for uh, in two days' time for liftoff. But we're going to go to the gantry. So I'm looking at the gantry. We're at 4,000 feet. The desert's at 4,000 feet. Not unlike Denver, which if you've been to Denver at 5,000 feet, get off the airplane, you're already breathless because you're a mile up in the air. So they said, all right, uh, let's go up the gantry. And I said, I don't know. Why am I here? I don't want to go up there. All right, so I got three flights, <laughs> and I stopped, wait a minute, let's look at the beauty <laughs> of the desert, and I go up another three, and finally I make it to the 11 flights, and I'm sucking in there, and I'm tickled over, and I'm looking, and I see a room about the size of this stage, and I'm looking, and I can see through the door, and it's about a foot thick, and I, there was, What's the room for? And I said, ah, it's just a, you know, it's a foot thick in cement, and you can see that there are uh, tubes of air uh, there, and, uh, and uh, electrical communication was down below. And I said, well, what's the room for? <laughs> and they said, in case something goes wrong. <laughs> what could go wrong? I mean, I mean, what, what could go wrong? So I get back down and done me. It occurs to me. They've got me there a day early to see if the old guy could make it up the gantry. <laughs> that was kind of, I mean, I didn't say to them. I thought, oh, jeez. Like, why didn't they have an elevator? <laughs> okay, so now we rehearse. And this is what we rehearse. There's a chair like that one there, except you're like this. And the whole thing, the next two days, was taken up with getting into a five-point harness. Arm, arm, shoulder, shoulder, and crotch. Except your back here like this. Because the seat is taking, taking on two jobs. <clears throat> one is to get you prone as much as possible because there's going to be as many as seven G's, seven gravity forces on you. Now, I've been up in, uh, in, in F-16, seated behind, and the pilot made a turn. It was about seven G's there, and when those pilots, when those, uh, military pilots make a tight turn, their suit is an air suit, and automatically it inflates to stop the blood from going down into your legs and coming out of your brain. So all the blood in your brain starts to go into your feet, and the, seat, the suit swells up to stop it. On that F-16, the guy made a tight turn, and I fainted. I went, oh, no. and then, oh, uh, they don't want you to think on the spaceship. So they had the seat back like this. But it was one thing to get out of it, just you hit the center part of it, uh, or twist the center part of a five-point harness. The problem is now you're weightless, and you got to get back into that. Wait, let's see, there, there, and that's okay, 
everything's all right except for the crotch piece. <laughs> which you, you can't find where so. Yeah, I laughed a lot too. So, I never did find the hole. Okay? So, a couple of things happened along the way, which I might as well tell you about. So, the next two days later, we get to the to the gantry, and there is the rocket ship, and there's some gas bleeding out of the exhaust. Uh, so what's that? I said, well, it's, you know, it's excess gas. Just, what kind of gas? Oh, no. Hydrogen. It's hydrogen. <laughs> I'm sure most of you have seen the documentary on the Hindenburg, yeah. 300 feet long, the length of this thing here, and, and what they did, they, they only found this out later. So this lighter than air Zeppelin called the Hindenburg lands in New Jersey. And then they throw a rope down, because it's like a ship, it's an airship, and they Tie it off. In the act of tying it off, static electricity along the ground went up the road and along the illuminized surface of the Zepp of the Hindenburg, and way back there in one of the bags that contained hydrogen, the static electricity spark eliminate fire on that gas the whole ship burned and there's documentary footage people this size running running and running and the announcers of the documentary famous words he said oh, oh the, the humanity of the because people are dying burning to death that's what I remember about hydrogen. <laughs> so now, the four of us get in this spaceship and lie down. And, and this is the God's truth. The announcer, the guy, the countdown said, okay, we're removing the gantry now. Anybody who wants to get off, better get off now. I started to walk <laughs> And then I thought, no, I can't do that. I can't be heard. Yes, <laughs> so because of you, I stayed. I risked my life. <laughs> and then, T minus 16, T minus 14, T minus uh, hold. There's an anomaly. What the hell is an anomaly? <laughs> an anomaly is when something is, shouldn't be there. Like me, I shouldn't have been there. <laughs> I was the anomaly. There's an anomaly. Hold the cap. Oh my God. What's this thing going to explode? Like the Hindenburg? Okay, anomaly, no anomaly. We're going to, I think, mean, go ahead. Count down, lift off. So, I left you off, and this dude gravitational forces on my chest to a point where I think I'm going to die. And all of a sudden, it's relief. The Carmen line is like 50,000 feet up. Get above that, you're out of the, the pull of gravity. Suddenly, everything is light, and you're floating, and I'm out of the sea. Now, this was the second voyage of that Blue Origin that the first voyage was the owner of Blue Origin and Amazon. Jeff Bezos went up with his brother and a lady, a somewhat elderly lady uh, astronaut and a young kid. Okay, I don't know how they found, I mean, you know, Bezos' brother is obvious, how they found what they did with the uh, lady astronaut. 
or where they found the kid, I don't know. But there are cameras everywhere on the spaceship. So this is what I see of uh, either the richest or the second richest man in the world. He's floating in weightlessness, and his back is to the camera, and his feet are splayed, okay, like this. And he's floating in the air like this, and the kid is over here throwing candies at his asshole. And I'm thinking, that's not what I'm going to do. So, when they said, wait, let's get out of this thing, and the others are celebrating being there, I go to the window. Now, for some reason, I've been looking back, and what I saw looking back is something I've never heard discussed before. There was a wink, like a shit, like a submarine going through the water. Look the back there, it's going through the air. In the blue air, it's leaving a wink. I've never heard anybody say that before. It's back there. And then I look up front. I, I spent a good part of my life reading, talking, listening to space things. Like, you know, constellations and, 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 and collections of stars and, and, and looking at the Hubble and then recently looking at the web as a telescope. And, and the mystery of space has intrigued me for my life. What goes on? up there is so dynamic, is so creative and destructive at the same time, the forces at work in the universe are unimaginable. I mean, and the weird things, the way the Big Bang, everything exploded, now gravity should be at work and everything should be contracting. It's not contracting, it's expanding at an increasing rate of speed. How is it contracting? It shouldn't be contracting. Nobody knows. They call it black matter, black energy. They don't know. 90, 95% of the universe is this black energy, and we don't know what it is. Neil deGrasse Tyson, buddy, I have arguments with him on the air and on television. How can you know? What are you talking to us about? And telling us these stars that you don't know? What makes you think speed, uh, light, light is the defining speed? How do we know that? 95% it's like looking through a gauze curtain. You can't see anything in this black energy and black matter. So we, we've gone around on that. But what we can see, the formations of, of stars, and, I mean, it's incomprehensible. It's so, destructive and constructive. It's both imploding and exploding, sometimes at the same time. Great flashes of light that go across the universe. I've been fascinated by space. I've talked to great experts. I interviewed Stephen Hawking. I mean, I, I'm fascinated by that. Looking through a telescope, what I saw was blackness. There was none of those mysterious, wonder, wondrous things in space. It was total blackness. I have been in a cave where they shut the door to the cave, and the blackness in the cave is so palpable, it's so there that you almost feel it in your face. You can't move your feet, you're, you're afraid. That kind of blackness is the blackness of space. And that's what I saw. That's death. And that, the blue, the beige of the desert, the white of the clouds, that's life. That's life. That's death. And then I could see the curvature of the earth. About like that. So if I finished this giant circle, I would have encompassed this rock that we all live on. It's tiny. 
No, I mean it. I've driven across, I, when I was going to, uh, from high school to university, I thumbed my way from Montreal down to San Diego, up to Vancouver, across to Chicago, back to Montreal, all in the summer before I went to, to college. I went on my thumb. It was endless. I've driven in a, in a, on a motorcycle recently from Chicago to, to Los Angeles on a, on a, in a motorcycle. I've been uh, in a truck. I've been in a car by myself with family. I've been in a truck with a dog. I've been in a truck alone. I've gone across this country endless times. And I'm telling you, the roads disappear into infinity and it goes on forever. Ever. It's not. This is a So I'm, I'm interviewing Steve Hawking. I've gone to Cambridge University in England to interview one of the finest minds of the 20th century. And I'm waiting to go to his house to interview him, and I'm sitting in the Cambridge University Cathedral, which is very much like the great cathedral in London. It's a little bit smaller, but incredibly large. It's empty. I'm sitting in whatever you call that shaft of the, of the cathedral goes up and all the stained glass window, windows and I'm sitting in it just like enjoying being alone in this giant building. And they were cleaning the organ. And I don't know what they used, whether they were using rubs, but the guy cleaning would play a chord and then he'd clean and he'd play another chord. So it was almost like Beethoven. Boom! This thing, and it was reverberating. I was sitting there alone in the cathedral. It was like an enormous experience. And I looked up, and the sun was uh, uh, shining through the stained glass windows. And for a moment, a moat of dust caught the sunlight. And I thought, Oh my God, that's what Earth must look like in the universe. It's a, Tiny, un, almost unviewable particle of dust. That's what Earth is like. It's so small. It's small. It's a small, negligible planet in a negligible, negligible Milky Way. We're, ne we're, we're negligible. The Earth is negligible. And then we're this little thing crawling on the Earth. They're like bacteria. <laughs> oh, we're negligible. So all those thoughts were in my mind when we came down. When we landed, I found myself crying. Everybody else was going through the champagne and the, I'm sobbing. I don't know what's wrong with me. What's wrong with me, I finally realized, was that I was in grief for the earth. Everything was dying. As I'm speaking to you, things are going extinct. Things we didn't know existed. It took 5.8 billion years to arrive at this life, the life, there's life on this planet. There must be life all over the universe because life has such an urgency to it. I'm going to live! I'm going to live! So this tree on the bleak oceanscape, just holding on to the, the, the rock, it's 5,000 years old. You see these, these cedar trees just holding on to life. Um, um, What is it called? Um, everything, I can't think of the word. Uh, everything's alive. Everything is alive and foaming, trying to live. Trees are sending green up. Slime was the word. Slime! <laughs> Bloody slime! It's always looking for the sunlight. It's got enough intelligence. Slime! 
to get out of a out of a maze and look for the sun to live. There's such an urgency to life. 5.8 billion years of evolution. So no matter what it is, whether it's an insect, whether it's a worm, whether it's us, whether it's an elephant, it doesn't matter. It's taken all this time for life in all its urgency to assume the shape and manner that we marvel and it's going to extinct. Things we didn't know existed. How tragic is that? It's one thing to say, oh, you should have been here when there were lions. Let me show you a picture of a lion. And my grandfather saw a lion in it. We're not, we're not, there's no picture, there's no description of the things that are disappearing, these magical, sacred things that are going extinct while we poison the air and the water. And that's what I was crying about. I made one other observation. And that is, however intelligent elephants, orcas, bonobos, whatever intelligence they are, whatever they're thinking and doing and seeing, I don't think they know that death exists. We're all going to die. We're all, from the moment we're born, we're on our way to our death. That's an incredible fact that all human beings live. What is, what, what are we here? What, what are we doing? I think we're here as observers of the mirror at all of life. Life here, life in outer space, the way planets and constellations are formed and live and die. We're looking at this. We're the only ones that are conscious, at least on Earth, that are looking with awe and with wonder at this incredible things up there and down here. Look how awesome you are. You're all awesome. And everything around us is awesome. And we're witnessing. That's what we human beings are doing. And that's what I'm saying. just like raising a hand. All right, gentlemen. <laughs> Did I have fun shooting American pickers? I've never been asked that before. That's wild. What, in a nice loud voice, and I'll answer your question, why are you asking me that? You're a huge fan of American pickers. And you want me to talk about American pickers and not about myself, is that right? <laughs> <laughs> I, I had the best time. They are, they're, they're fun, guys. Are they, uh, is the program still on? So I have, I have a, a house. I'm embarrassed to have anything. I have a house in uh, Kentucky, and and I forgot whether they they were they invited to come in and do something, and I thought, oh, what a great way to fix this house up by using them. So I did the show, and and the house was enhanced in many ways. One of the ways was it's on a, the house is on a creek that becomes a river when it rains, and there is a remnants of a green a grinder where farmers would bring the corn to the grinder and the water would move the 
two granite stones and grind the grain. So it was, uh, it was, it was a famous piece of land during the time when, when uh, they were growing that kind of thing in that part of, of the state. So we made that our chief, uh, the, the big thing we were going to get as an antique. Uh, uh, the other, the, 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 the bottom part was still in the water and it was like was spectacular. Now we had to get the top stone. Well, they found the top stone, put it there, and they made a great, uh, a great uh, office, with leather chairs and old-fashioned stuff. Now I had a great experience with it. So they're still going out looking for. The problem is this: the more those programs are on the air, the more conscious we become of how valuable uh, those items are. So when they go into, you know, they used to be able to get a model T, go into some itinerant farmer, and the farmer says, oh, get that model T out of here. I just, I, I haven't moved it in 60 years. Say, oh, okay, we'll move it for you. Now, of course, it's worth a fortune. So how do you go to a farmer and say, we'll move that model T? And he'll say, yeah, for $100,000. So I think they're up against it. Yes, sir. Okay. This when <laughs> Halloween the movie, Michael Myers, William Shatner, Mask. Yeah. <laughs> what do I think about that? <laughs> I'm horrified. <laughs> I'm part of a Halloween gang. <laughs> no, apparently the story is this. So on Star Trek, we were they were always putting stuff on my face, you know, prosthetics. Prosthetics made by the Westmores, uh, who made the makeup, Westmore makeup. <laughs> to the point, so the Westmores made a death mask, they call it, of me, so they didn't have to put it on my face every time. They could put it on the death mask, cut it out, measure it, and then when the time came, just slap it on me, and we knew it would fit. But Westmore had branched out. He was making prosthetics for people who had, for one reason or another, surgery on their face. So he would make noses for people who had to have their noses taken off, or cheeks or eyes. So I was doing a show in which I was doing uh, three different makeups for every hour of the show. So the, the, the show would fill it for a week, and during that week, I was playing three different characters with different makeups. So I got to know uh, uh, one of the Westmore brothers very well, because we'd sit there, I'd sit there for hours while he would put stuff on my face. So while he was waiting for the paint to dry, he would show me books of prosthetics that he put on people's face. And so you would see into the, like, the nose cavity. If they take the nose and build it off, it's a real cavity. And I'm sitting there with this drying paint, and he's showing me pictures of people without noses or of an eye socket, and he's very proud of his work, and I'm getting ill. I want to vomit. I don't want to vomit all over Mr. Westmore. It was, it was horrible, horrible. But they made this mask of me to avoid that, and then when the show was over, when uh, Star Trek was over, they, I don't know, they tried to dispose of the mask, but somebody got a hold of it and made replicas of it and sold it as a Halloween mask. It's, it's a de death mask of me. And it's supposed to be a murderous killer. <laughs> my final revenge on everybody was my kids, when they were small, I would take them out trick-or-treating. And they would wear their disguise 
and I'd wear my mask. <laughs> trick or treat? No, we don't have any treats. Okay, here's our trick. And I would peel the mask off. Oh my God, that'd be horrifying. <laughs> well, yeah. Yes, sir. No, we're right. Give you the mic. Now, right up against your mouth, okay. nice and loud. All right, thank you. Even uh, louder. Bill, Bill, it's a really a joy to see you here today. What was that? It's a joy to see you here today. Oh, it's a and joy. There's a movie that you were in. It's a cult classic by the name of Pray for the Wildcats. Pray for the Wildcats. Yeah. And uh, starred evil Andy Griffith and yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. motorcycles. There was a motorcycle where it looks like you're wearing Star Trek uniforms that were recycled. And I'm just wondering if Re you know... Re-bicycle. Recycled. And I'm just wondering if you know anything about that. No, I think... Uh, I don't remember when, it, when the Pray for the Wildcats was made. I think it might have been before Star No, it didn't have anything to do with Star Trek. What it had to do with this motorcycle. I love motorcycles. I'm standing in line, or I'm, st I'm in, people are standing in line, and I'm signing out of this, okay? And the guy, the guy here, he says, uh, I'm part of, um, the name of the company was uh, Something Motors, and Something Motors, and we would like to build you a motorcycle. Why not? A free motorcycle. At that time, I was talking to a sculptor friend of mine. And I said, wait a minute. Because the sculptor friend of mine said, I'd like to, to create a motorcycle that would be in the Museum of Modern Art. I mean, a, like a horse. Like a motorcycle that looked like a horse. I said, well, wait, I got an offer from a company that wants to make a motorcycle. You want to carve one, let's combine both. So I brought the sculptor and the, and the, uh, and the motorcycle maker together. And we started to fashion the motorcycle. Anyway, the sculptor got, he didn't want to work with anybody else. He left and the company to make the motorcycle uh, was left. And we, they made a motorcycle. A motorcycle that looks like it belongs on Star Trek with a 500 Cadillac horse, 500 horsepower Cadillac engine. And, and it was incredible. Incredibly, uh, uh, there was an incredible dream. And everything was great except we, uh, it was late in being developed, late, 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 and finally 150 people from the press are in uh, Illinois, in just south of Chicago, and the motorcycle finally arrives late, and they unveil it. I get in, I punch the button for the 500 horsepower engine. This thing is rear, and then I put it into gear, and I try to steer, and the steering doesn't work. 150 people from the press were there. So we retired to the boardroom, and we don't know what to do. I mean, I've been promoting this trip across the country. We decide to rent me a motorcycle from Harley Davidson, and we'll truck this motorcycle across the country to every American Legion post and we would raise funds for American Legion. I was shooting it as a documentary, and we were doing 500 miles a day. Motorcycles. So, I became the motorcycle guy. And stuntmen would talk to me about motorcycles like I knew what I was doing. I, I don't. I just don't have to stay on top of it. So we get to, a, on, the, on this film, we, we're now at a sand dune, and it requires 
me as the character to take off and make a leap over the sand dune. And so I said, I, I can do this to the director. He said, no. <laughs> no, I think you are. Stuntman? No, we got to put a stuntman. I said, I can do the game. No. Because <laughs> if you hurt your little finger, get that little bit of finger. You can't work the next day. We can't work. And if you, I let you on the motorcycle, the insurance will pay off. So if you hurt your little, bitty, little, bitty, bitty, bitty finger, that's why when all these actors say, I do my own stunts, they do their own stunts. <laughs> they can't get insurance if they do their own stunts. So they put a motorcycle guy, a stuntman on the motorcycle. And so he takes off and he drives up the motorcycle, up the sand dune, and soars. And I'm watching from the side. Boom, and he lands, and he lands, bang, and he falls down. And everybody rushes over, I rush over. George, you okay, you okay? I'm going, oh my God, oh my God. And his girlfriend comes running down from the other, comes running, and she kneels beside him, George, George. And she looks up, she says, oh, William Shatner. Can I have your autograph? And she's driven in sand all over the world. He turns out to be paraplegic, he never walked in. On that note, I need you. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you, thank you, thank you.